So this morning we want to talk about Moses as a servant of God. And uh, he's, it's there in verse 5 that we read of Deuteronomy chapter 34. It describes him as the servant of Yahweh who died there in the land of Moab according to the word of Yahweh. So what a wonderful title as Moses was laid to rest. The servant of Yahweh. Moses was a servant of God by his own choice. He chose to endure suffering and hardship with the people of Israel rather than to be great in the land of, of, of the pharaohs. And then as a servant waits upon his master throughout his, throughout his whole life, he waited upon God for direction, didn't he? And he received instruction to lead Israel out of Egypt at the burning bush. And after initially hesitating because his own perceived you know, inabilities and lack of self-confidence to be entrusted with such a task, he faithfully carried out God's objective in magnifying Yahweh as the only true God as Egypt was judged with the ten plagues and Israel was delivered out of Egypt. And then on Mount Sinai, he received God's law, his instructions, and he endeavoured to do all things after the pattern which was shown to him in that holy mountain. And though he was Israel's leader, he never acted on his own authority, but was always the lowliest instruments of the divine will. His respect for Yahweh was deep. His devotion to God's way was thorough. And his confidence in the Lord's word was constant. And so as we read in verse 10, there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom Yahweh knew face to face. Now turn over to Numbers 12, because here we have a, another important place where we read Yahweh describing Moses as his servant. And, of course, Numbers 12, the context here is that of Miriam and Aaron opposing Moses and trying to claim equal authority. So Numbers chapter 12, verse 6, and he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, Yahweh, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so who is faithful in all mine house. My servant Moses, again, there it is. He is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in dark speeches, and the similitude of Yahweh shall he behold. Wherefore, to Moses and uh, to Aaron and Miriam, were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So Moses was a faithful servant to God in all his house. In, in the Hebrew, the word faithful actually has the sense of something that's firm, reliable, dependable. So Moses was someone that God could depend on, rely on. And because of this, God spoke to him directly, mouth to mouth. Okay, Of course, it was likely to be one of the angels like Gabriel who spoke with him, mouth to mouth, face to face. And apart from... The one incident at the end of his life where at the waters of Meribah he slipped up. You never see him overstepping his office or neglecting it. He remained a reliable servant from the time he was called at the burning bush until the hour when he passed on his role. He died and passed on his role to his successor Joshua. So our exhortation today will focus on Moses and how he was a great type of Christ as a servant of God. We know Philippians chapter 2 speaks about that with respect to Jesus Christ, doesn't it? Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant. There it is. And he was made in the likeness of men. And being found fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, like Moses, 
we are all destined to die. Some sooner than others. Some in an untimely manner. There was a, a brother in Adelaide who died all of a sudden, a sudden accident. You may have heard Brother Bruce Gerd, who goes to Cumberland. It was shocking news that he died une unexpectedly yesterday. But we're all going to die at some point. The only exception will be if the Lord returns tomorrow and we are part of that generation that is alive and remains until the day Christ appears. But the key issue is this. Whether we die or whether we're still alive and called to the judgment seat of Christ, will we be recognised by God and Jesus Christ as faithful servants? Are we servants that God can trust and rely upon to do his work? So to help answer this, and as you think about it, let's consider Moses and the circumstances surrounding his death. Uh, let's consider him as he climbed all the way up to the peak of Mount Nebo, which in Deuteronomy 32, and uh, I'll just go back to it there. We, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, and verse 49 is called Abarim. Get thee up into this mountain, Abarim, unto Mount Nebo. But here in chapter 34, it seems to be called Pisgah. In chapter 34, verse 1, unto the mountain of Nebo, to the top of Pisgah. So that would be saying more or less that at Mount Nebo, the peak, the top, is called Pisgah. I guess it's a bit like Sinai and Horeb. It's the same general area, but the specific high mountain is called Horeb. Here he went up all the way to Pisgah, to the peak of Mount Nebo. And as we consider Moses on this mount, climbing up this mountain alone, we ask the same question, would we be prepared to meet our death as willingly as Moses did, the servant of Yahweh? And it's the same as asking ourselves, are we ready for Christ to return right now? Okay, Right now, are we ready? For the difference between our death and the return of Christ is but a night's sleep, really, from our perspective, isn't it? And so in verse 5 of Deuteronomy 34, again, our theme for today, Moses, the servant of Yahweh, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of Yahweh. So he died according to the word of Yahweh. Now, what does that mean? And I want to go through four ways or four explanations as to how Moses died according to the word of Yahweh. The first is the obvious. Uh, we know that May Moses made a mistake in not honouring God at the waters of Meribah, at Kadesh. And uh, so the first reason is it was according to the judgment or the sentence of Yahweh that he died. But there's three other reasons as well. The, third, the second reason we'll explore is according to the fate of natural Israel. The third is according to the foreknowledge and appointment of Yahweh. It was the time God had determined for him to die in his foreknowledge. And the fourth reason we may not think about much, but we want to talk about a little bit this morning. He actually died according to the loving wisdom, the grace and the favor of Yahweh. It was God's loving wisdom that he should die at this point in time. All right, so let's, let's come. So again, the four reasons, according to the sentence of Yahweh, according to the fate of natural Israel, according to the foreknowledge and appointment of Yahweh, and the fourth, according to the loving wisdom, grace and favour of God. So let's look at the first one, according to the judgment or sentence of God. Now, Moses must have known for some time that he would die without setting foot in the land of Canaan because of what happened, his mistake at the waters of Meribah. And come back to that in Numbers chapter 20. In Numbers chapter 20, God gave some very clear instructions to Moses. Numbers chapter 20 and verse 7. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye... Unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so that 
So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. So there was the clear instruction of God to take the rod, but with Aaron, and speak to the rock. However, we know that instead, as the record goes on here in Numbers 20, that instead of speaking to the rock, he struck the rock twice. And secondly, he failed to give God the glory and the recognition. He said, here, here now, you rebels, must we fetch water? He attributed what would happen to Aaron and himself. And so in verse 12, the judgment came. And Yahweh spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, verse 13, because the children of Israel strove with Yahweh and he was sanctified in them. Now, if we read Deuteronomy 34 in isolation, like we have this morning, it's easy to think that Moses' death on Mount Nebo then followed directly after here in Numbers chapter 20. Okay, The next day, God said to Moses, get up to the mountain and die. But that's not the case. It's, it's, it took some time. It's approximately two years from the point in Numbers 20 to the point where he actually died on Mount Nebo. And he still played a vital role for a considerable period of time. After Numbers 20, we have another 15 chapters through to Numbers 36, packed with events which would have required all of Moses' energy and abilities. So he just didn't sit around wallowing in misery after being told that he's going to die. He faithfully continued to lead the people towards the promised land and recorded everything that happened, including his own failings. And so, for example, in num as we flick through Numbers, Numbers 20, we have the death of Aaron um, in the latter part of the chapter. Then in Numbers 21, we have the people complaining as they rebelled. They rebelled as they journey, and we have the incident of God sending fiery serpents, and then Moses lifting up the brazen serpent, teaching the important lesson that faith and salvation would come outside the law of Moses. Numbers 22 to 25. The story of Balaam, the account of the prophet Balaam, who was hired by the Moabites to try and curse, curse Israel, to make God curse Israel. The cursings didn't work, as God could only bless Israel. But tragically, we know, Balaam exposed to Balak what would work, and that is to tempt Israel via the Moab Moabitish women to commit fornication, and that would result in God cursing Israel. And so it did. Thousands were destroyed by God at that time. Numbers 26, we have the census taken of the new generation. Numbers 27, the daughters of Zelophe, the, the, the amazing story the daughters of Zelophe had, who stood up to claim their inheritance and it was granted. Numbers 27, the appointment of Joshua to replace Moses. Numbers 32, Reuben and Gad, okay, and their preference to settle on the east side of Jordan. And, of course, that was granted on the condition that they go through and still help Israel defeat the Canaanites. And so it goes on, Numbers 35, the cities for the Levites. We read about the cities of the refuge, which Moses instructed about, very important cities in Israel. So, so, and above that, he had responsibility for the manuscripts of the law and including writing and speaking the whole of Deuteronomy during this final period as well. So a considerable period trans transpired between the tragic events at Meribah at the waters of Meribah in Numbers 20, until the death of Moses in Deuteronomy 34. Now, excluding Joshua and Caleb, we know that Moses was the last of those who were 20 years or older when they came out of Egypt to die in the wilderness. But still, from a natural point of view, it seems disappointing that Moses should die at this point, so close to the land of promise. His whole life had been leading to this. And the last 40 years, he was, he, he'd freed Israel from Egypt. He was conducting them all the way to the land of promise, confronting Pharaoh, breaking the pride of Egypt. And then through the wilderness, sorely tested it as he carried that nation in his bosom, interceding time and time again on their behalf caring for them as a shepherd does for his sheep. 
speaking with Yahweh, being shown his glory, receiving all the laws and the ways of God. And yet, even though he was 120 years old, it was not with respect to his condition. He wasn't exactly stumbling around, you know, with a walking stick. Okay, as Deuteronomy 34 verse 7 states, his eye, as we read this morning, his eye was not dim, nor his natural forces abated. He still had, had the peak of his physical strength with him. And he might have thought, look, my, my father, Amran, he died at 137. His grandfather, Kohath, died at 133. And his great-grandfather, Levi, 137. They'd all lived beyond 120. Why can't I? So he was still capable of so much work. You think about him at this point, he's more mature, more gracious, more wiser than any point he had been in his life. The whole of Deuteronomy is a testament to this. So Moses was still in the prime of his abilities to lead God's people. But now the mandate was given. Get thee up into the mountain and die. Now, this would have come as a bitter disappointment to him, naturally speaking. To have toiled for so long, right? to see the land but not to enter it, to bring the tribes to the east side here of the River Jordan but not to cross and then to die in Moab after all. There was never a, more, a servant of God more favoured and yet he was condemned to death because of a single slip-up. For, what, for the one occasion he tried to be the master instead of the servant, he was punished. But you see, there's an important principle here, isn't there? Those in positions of authority come under greater condemnation. That's James chapter 3, verse 1. As an example for others not to repeat their mistakes. And this was particularly so for those under the law of Moses who approached God. You remember what happened to two of Aaron's sons in Leviticus 10, Nadab and Abihu. They were struck dead for doing things the wrong way, not as God had clearly instructed, for offering strange fire. And God at that time had revealed a very important principle that he will be sanctified in them that come near unto him. And so now Moses himself, as a highly favoured servant of God, had not sanctified God and could not escape the law of Moses, which had previously executed death for such offences, such as Nadab and Abihu. So the law proved to be a ministration of death, even for Moses himself. Now, let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 3, where we learn that Moses actually pleaded with God to reconsider. He didn't just leave it at that. He actually asked God, please, let me live a bit longer to go over the Jordan and walk in the land. Deuteronomy 3, verse 23. And I besought Yahweh at that time. He appealed, didn't he? He, he implored to God. Verse 24. O oh, oh Lord Yahweh, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy might? I pray thee, let me go over. Let me see the good land that is beyond the Jordan, that goodly mountain and Lebanon. This was a fair request, wasn't it? We, we know that previously Moses appealed to God for the whole nation and God several times answered him. And when Moses even dared to say, I beseech thee, show me thy glory, God answered his prayer, placed him in the cleft of the rock and made all his goodness to pass before him. But not this time. Even though it was a small thing, we read on. Verse 26, Deuteronomy 3. But Yahweh was wroth with me for your sakes and would not hear me. And Yahweh said unto me, let it suffice thee. Speak to me no more of this matter. Don't raise it again. That's it. So Moses never appealed to God on this matter again. He would have bowed his head and accepted God's will that he should die in Moab. But, but here we read that there's actually more than merely Moses' mistake alone that was the problem. As in all of God's decisions, 
others were benefiting and taught a very important lesson surrounding the death of Moses. And there are three notable instances in Deuteronomy. There's three occasions in the book of Deuteronomy where Moses explains the reason why he was not allowed to go into the promised land. And on each occasion, it's not the reason recording in Numbers chapter 20. The first one is what we just read here in Deuteronomy 3 verse 26. But Yahweh was wroth with me for your sakes and would not hear me. The next one. Oh, actually, the first one is in Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 37. Same thing. Also, Yahweh was angry with me for your sakes. And then the third occasion is Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 21. Furthermore, Yahweh was angry with me for your sakes and swear that I should not go over to Jordan and that I should not go into that good land which Yahweh giveth thee for an inheritance. So, and actually in the, in the Hebrew there, when it says Yahweh was angry with me for your sakes, it, it's Yahweh was angry with me owing to your words. The Young's literal has it because of your words, and the Septuagint has this sense as well. So God was angry because of the words of the people. What were the words of the people? We'll come back to Numbers chapter 20. In verse 2 of Numbers 20, there was no water for the congregation and they gathered themselves together against Moses and Aaron. And the people chode or strove, complained with Moses. And they said, this was their words, would God that we have died when our brethren died before Yahweh? And why have you brought up the congregation of Yahweh into this wilderness that we and our cattle should die? It's a complete lack of faith, there isn't there, in their, in their words. Verse 5, wherefore have ye made us to come out of Egypt, blaming Moses and Aaron, to bring us unto this evil place? It's no place of seed, figs, or of vines, or pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. So these words were spoken against Moses. False accusations against God's servant Moses. In striving with God's servant Moses, they were striving with God. Cast your eye down to verse 13, because this is what it says. This is the water of Meribah, right? Not because Moses slipped up, but because the children of Israel strove with Yahweh and he was sanctified in them. And so this then connects with our second reason as to why Moses died, according to the word of Yahweh. And that is, it was according to the fate of natural Israel. Moses died as a type of natural Israel who he represented. And it's appropriate then, because Moses was thoroughly associated with the people that died in the wilderness. For their sake, he'd given up his life as the prince of Egypt. And now for their sake, he would lose his heart's desire for a home in Israel. When they sinned, he interceded. When Yahweh offered that he would make a great nation out of Moses alone and destroy the rest, Moses declined based on his love for Israel. He lived for the nation and for the nation he died. And once he went so far to say, as we know, if not, if you can't forgive them, then if not, blot me, I pray thee out of thy book, which thou hast written. So the record shines a spotlight on Moses as the father to the whole nation. And so he was laid to rest with the older generation whom he devoted his life to. For their faithful, faithlessness, the previous generation were consigned to die in the wilderness and not enter the promised land. But now the next generation, the younger generation, are making the same mistake. They're showing a great lack of faith as well. But this time, they will go into the promised land, but Moses will die in the wilderness. And so God's justice was appropriate. Appropriate for Moses and appropriate on all the people as a constant reminder of what had happened. By their unfaithful complaints, Moses was prevented from going into the promised land. 
And they would all think about that, well, they should at least, deeply, as they entered the promised land and settled down there for years to come. And it was only by grace under the leadership of Joshua that they entered the land. Like Moses, they knew that they really should have died in the wilderness. Okay, It was their mistake at the waters of Meribah, their lack of faith. But Moses died. And so the third sense then in which Moses died according to the word of Yahweh is because it was the right time in God's foreknowledge. Okay, According to the foreknowledge of God. All the details of the death of Moses had been ordered by God. The time, the place, the circumstances. As we've seen, immediately after what happened, the events at the waters of Meribah, Moses didn't die straight away. He still had a lot of work to complete over around two years. It was a full, full after that period, then the time came. God's appointed time for Moses to die came. So his death was not an accident or premature. And, and this applies to many in the faith, many of the faithful in the Bible. We often wonder, why did they die when they had so much work still to do? But God knows. God knows the appropriate and best time for a, his servants to die. It explains why the two sons of Jebedee, James and John, okay, among the apostles, James was the first one to die. Why? <laughs> but John was the last one to die on the Isle of Patmos. Moses died without seeing the result of his life's work, didn't he? It was all there before him. Joshua took it on. And it's likewise true for many of the faithful in the Bible. Most of them die before the object which they had in view is fully accomplished. But you see, from God's point of view, it was never the work of Moses to lead Israel into the promised land. It was to be the work of Joshua the type of Jesus Christ. Moses wished to do this, but it was not his work to do. From God's point of view, Moses had finished what God wanted him to do. It's a bit like David, who wanted to build the temple, but he was told, sorry, you can't. David could gather the gold and silver to build the temple, but he was told not to build it. Solomon, his son, undertook the work. And so many of the prophets of Israel rose and spoke out against all the evil, but they themselves were unable to destroy or remove all of those evils. Their successors continued the work. And so it's the same for us, all the faithful who are seemingly cut off early in life. Most of the faithful so, so that others may reap or benefit, that others may continue the work of God. And so this is the basis upon which we faithfully endeavour to serve God. It's impossible by our own efforts to accomplish everything. We just play a small role. We, we, we hope to contribute a small part to the spiritual temple that God is building based on the foundation stone of Jesus Christ. And others then continue where we leave off to continue building. And most importantly, coming back to Moses, it was divinely appointed that he should die before entering the promised land because he stood for the law of Moses, which was unable to give eternal life. The Mosaic law was a ministration of death. It just reminded them that they were sinners and worthy of death. It couldn't provide salvation. So it was not for Moses to give the people rest, for the law gives no man rest and cannot give eternal life. Only Joshua or Jesus can bring us grace and truth. And so if Moses had have led them into Canaan, the allegory would be teaching that eternal life could be attained by keeping the works of the law, which we know is not right. And so as Moses was laid asleep and buried by divine hands, the principle was being taught that so must the law cease to rule that the new covenant of grace may be fully effectively. And the final sense that we want to consider this morning as to how Moses died according to the word of Yahweh is it was Yahweh's love. It was his grace and his favour for Moses to die now. After a long life of dedicated service, it was God's wisdom that Moses should now be laid to rest. He'd given up a life of luxury in Egypt and led a hard life of trial and sorrow. 
caring for a rebellious nation. And so Moses' death, according to the word of Yahweh, was actually a blessing. His life's work was over. There was no need for him to continue striving, to go in and face all the challenges, uh, difficulties of leading the people. And you read Deuteronomy, he knew they would be rebellious once they entered the land. Things wouldn't change. Human nature doesn't change. But that role was now to be taken on by Joshua. And so his next joy in life would be to reward, be, to be rewarded with immortal life at the resurrection. And then inherit the, the life, inherit the land forever. And so as Revelation 14, verse 13 says, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. And that was true for Moses. Yea, said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labours and their works do follow them. So for a moment, just, just think about the joys and pleasures that Moses had in life after he gave up the pleasures of Egypt. Who could he associate with? Who was his best friend to talk with and share all his troubles? Even Aaron, his brother, was a poor companion for Moses. He failed Moses several times, as we know. It was Aaron that yielded to the people's wishes and made the golden calf. With whom could Moses take counsel and talk as a friend? The record doesn't offer many insights on Moses' relationship with his wife during the exodus and the wilderness wanderings. And regarding his two sons, apart from their names being mentioned, there's no record of any conversation or interaction between Moses and his two sons. So largely Moses was alone. Where did he go for counsel, for help? Who did he delight to associate with? Well, what we do know is that is that since the burning bush, his true companion was the angel, wasn't it? Representing the eternal father who knew Moses face to face. And what we do know from Hebrews 11, the Apostle Paul tells us, is that Moses was a man of faith. He endured seeing him who is invisible. So Moses, like Enoch and Noah, was someone who truly walked with God. He valued and relied upon God's company more than anyone else. In Numbers 12, as we read before, it's, it's said that Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And so Moses truly humbled himself to walk with God. And so he wasn't really alone then as he climbed Mount Nebo, was he? It was appropriate that there should be no other, you know, Aaron, Aaron had died, uh, or was about to die, sorry, I think he had died, sorry, I'm getting mixed up, <laughs> Aaron had already died. But no one else, even Joshua, came up with him because his true companion was there with him, the one he'd been solely relying upon. That angel who was representing the Eternal Father was there with him. So when we think about that, as he, as he climbed, you know, up to pigs. Pisgah, the top of Mount Nebo, it was really a blessing that the angel of God, of God's presence, appeared to him for that, for that last time and enabled him to see with great clarity the land of promise. And he reiterated the promises made to the forefathers. And then that, and then that angel gently took him and laid him to rest. What an amazing burial. Sorry. And so as the angel then reiterated the promises that Moses, that, that God had given to the forefathers, Moses would have understood, wouldn't he, that, that the promised seed was foremost singular, referring to Jesus Christ. And just as Abraham saw the day of Christ, Moses understood everything about Christ, as Christ explained to the Pharisees. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. So it was love and wisdom that that true friend of Moses was there with him as he finally breathed his last breath. But from the vantage point up the top of Mount Nebo, Moses saw in faith the whole land and the true hope of Israel. He died according to the old covenant 
but he had faith that he will be resurrected based on the new covenant. And so as Moses was laid to rest on that mountain, we cannot skip the significance then of him appearing on another mountain in the record of the transfiguration of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not on Mount Nebo, but a higher mountain, this time within the promised land itself, most likely Mount Hermon. And this was a real event, not a vision, but a transfiguration of the glory that will be Christ when he reigned as king. And what were they speaking about with Moses and Elijah and Jesus Christ? What were they speaking about? They spoke about his decease or his exodus or what Jesus Christ would accomplish through his death. And so just as Moses, the servant of Yahweh, died according to the word of Yahweh, so Jesus Christ, the greater than Moses, even the, even the greater servant of Yahweh, died according to the word of Yahweh. And these four reasons we've gone through about the death of Moses echo or repeat as to why Christ died. Firstly, as Moses died before because of God's sentence, so Jesus Christ. It was right that he should die as he bore the same nature that was sentenced to death by God in consequence of Adam's sin. As Hebrews 2 verse 14 tells us, Christ was born with the problem of the diabolos, flesh and blood, tempted to sin with its power of death for the very reason of destroying this through his own death. And so Christ died, not in any substitutionary sense, but for himself and for us. He was made sin for us who knew no sin. He was born with that same death-stricken nature, with its bias to sin. And he still needed redemption from that death that Adam introduced into the world. And so it's because of this state that he was born with, he's able to be our representative, one among us who is the captain of our salvation so that through his death and resurrection, our sins may be forgiven and the problem of the diabolos in us all may ultimately be completely removed. Now, secondly, as Moses died as a type of, of the fate of natural Israel, so Christ on the cross demonstrated that the old man, the flesh, must be put to death. But in so dying, after a life of obedience, his death and resurrection consummated the new covenant, didn't it? which, based on faith, is able to save to the uttermost, even eternal life. And so when the veil of the temple was rent, as Christ was crucified on the cross, it marked that transition point, didn't it? The old covenant was done away and the new covenant ushered in. And thirdly, as Moses died according to the foreknowledge and appointment of Yahweh, so Christ died. As Acts says, according to the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, according to the promises that God made to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and to David, according to the figure of the brazen serpent, which Moses lifted up into the wilderness, according to the promise right from the beginning, after Adam and Eve had sinned in Genesis 3 verse 15, that he would have the victory over sin and death. And fourthly, as Moses died according to the loving wisdom, grace and favour of God, so it was with the death of Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And because Christ humbled himself and became obedient to the death of, of the cross, we know that God hath highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2 verse 9. So Moses, the servant of Yahweh, he died there in the land of Moab. And as we have seen through the life of Moses, a true servant is one who denies himself and does everything to help his brothers and sisters reach the kingdom of God. This is true agape love. We are called no longer, brethren and sisters, to be slaves to sin, but, but the servants of righteousness. Like Moses, our lives should be given over in service to helping the next generation, teaching Sunday school, building up the young people, preaching the gospel, while never compromising on what God has clearly revealed is saving truth, 
and our moral way of life, which the world is trying to change all the time. We must be lights shining in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Bright lights. The world must see our light. And if the Lord delays our coming, many of us will die. Some of us may face an untimely death, be cut off in our prime, road accident, or an accident or sickness, well before our allotted 70 years of life. But hopefully, our Lord will return very soon, today or even tomorrow. So right now, what we have to do is make sure we're trying our best to be faithful servants of God, so that when we stand before him, we may hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. Thank you.